And now, um, Dr. Ali Holzer from Bar Ilan University doesn't have a V no. in front of it. And Ellie's going to be speaking about the oral and the textual in the Swat and Mad. Good afternoon. You should all have a source sheet. Um, and if not, John has two extras. But I uh, distributed them ahead of time so that you be please bear with me as I want to begin with two quotes which are going to frame my paper. First quote. It's not on the page. In his best-selling law, in his best-selling Laughter, an essay on the meaning of the comic, published in 1900, the philosopher and Nobel Prize Henri Bergson writes, Deep in our souls, we should hear the strains of our, our inner life's unbroken melody, a music that is intermittently gay, but more frequently plaintive, and always original. All this is around and within us, and yet no whit of it do we distinctly perceive." End of quote. Second quote. In his book, The Infinite Conversation, 1969, a close friend of Emmanuel Levinas, French writer, philosopher, and literary theorist, Maurice Blanchot, writes as follow. I would say brutally that, that, that what we owe to Jewish monotheism is not the revelation of the one God, but the revelation of speech as the place where men hold themselves in relation with what excludes all relation. The infinitely distant, the absolutely foreign, God speaks, and man speaks to him. This is the great achievement of Israel." End quote. The Svatsemet's view on the oral encompasses both of these concepts. Existence is primarily a divinely, ever-renewed, unified melody in which every human dwells and which dwells in every, every human being. To close oneself off is to separate oneself from this melody, from life. In that regard, language and speech have an essential existentialist role. They have a creative and formative impact, enabling human beings to become a unique human being. At the same time, language establishes a fundamental rift between the person and existence closing him or her off from that vital, divine, dynamic dimension of existence. People need language for pragmatic purposes, to live, to act, to quantify, to conceptualize, and to communicate. But the use of language also has an inherent imprisoning effect, regardless of the speaker or writer's intent, and regardless of its divine origin, as in the case of the language of Torah. This paper discusses one of Satemet's conceptualizations of this dual nature of language and draws a few directions toward potential educational implications. Hasidic masters employed homilies, rashot, to inspire devotional, spiritual consciousness and practice. Rabbi Yehuda Ariel Leib Alter, 1847-1905, the leader of the Ger Hasidim, and a leading figure among Polish Jewry, wrote and dated the homilies that comprise his principal book, the Sfatemet homilies. But he wrote them after delivering them already. The name Sfatemet is used alternatively in reference to the collection of homilies and to its author. It covers more than 2,700 homilies delivered on Shabbatot and holidays during the 34, 35 years of Rabbi Alter's leadership. Like earlier Hasidic works, it is characterized by exegetical work in which biblical, rabbinic, and Kabbalistic concepts are reinterpreted in the spiritual psychological realm. From a structural, from a structural perspective, 
They are characterized by their abbreviated form, their innovative and aphoristic interpretations of traditional sources, and a subtle interplay of the hermeneutic work and the homolytic structure. In terms of content, they reflect a profound and nuanced understanding of sacred and religious life. Along with its traditional meaning, the term Torah Sheba al is used by the Sfatimet in reference to innovative interpretations of the textual tradition produced across the centuries. But in the context of this paper, it is a third meaning of oral Torah, Torah Sheba al that is of interest. Torah Sheba al refers, for the Sfatimet, to the concrete human act of interpreting the inherited textual tradition an event by which new understandings are produced in human speech. Or to paraphrase the Pistatemet, Torah Shebaal Peh, as it says, the Torah that comes into being through the Baal Hapeh, Alideh Baal Hapeh, the one who has mouth and speech. What lies at the center of the Pistatemet's interest is not only the intellectual innovation captured by the rabbinic concept of Chidush, new insight, but more importantly is the idea of hitchachut, renewal, a transformative event for the learner. From this vantage point, reading, interpreting, understanding, articulating are facets of an ontological event rooted in the ever-renewing flow of all of existence. This view is rooted in Kabbalistic traditions according to which, broadly speaking, the key to the essence of existence resides in language. Language and speech are a fundamental ontological category. Again, broadly speaking, Hasidism's major innovation in, is in integrating Kabbalistic is in integrating Kabbalistic conceptions that relate to God into a better understanding of human psychology, human experience, and human communication, as well as into human activity, especially in the realm of prayer and study. This dynamic understanding of language is also reflected in the interpretation of sources in Hasidic literature. The literal meaning of the Torah is simultaneously an existential meaning <coughs> waiting to be uncovered from within the text. The Sfatimet is part of that tradition. He draws on the Zohar according to which Ki be'oraita bara ha'kadosh baruch hu alma. God created the world through the Torah. In his view, the existence comes into being through the ma'amal, through the utterance of language, words and letters. This metaphorical use of the Torah as preceding creation reflects three attributes of language. It conceals, it discloses, and it creates presence. Let us look now at the Sfatimet's teachings on the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy. Moshe, who previously said about himself, Lo ish tevalim anuchi has now turned into a prolific rhetorician who speaks and generates the entire book of Deuteronomy. Ele hadvarim, first line, Ele hadvarim asher dibeir Moshe, kol Yisrael. Midrash Rabba and Rashi provide major building blocks for the Sfatimet's ideas. Midrash Devarim Rabba 1-1, source number 2 on your sheet, discusses two separate topics. First, line 8 to 12, it explores the broader question of whether it is permissible to translate the Torah into foreign languages. It concludes that according to the sages, translation into all languages is permissible. But according to Rabban Daniel, it is only permissible to translate into Greek. Rashi echoes the Midrash and quotes Midrash and Huma to bring this idea back to the biblical context. Source number 3. Be'er et Torah. Moshe isn't just speaking. He translates the Torah in 70 languages, a symbolic rabbinic number that stands for all human languages. We will notice that the word Lashon refers here to language, not to the tongue. The Midrash then proceeds to a second topic, lines 13 to 19. The power of the language of Torah to heal language. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, line 13, Re'e l'shona shel Torah ma'chaviva, shemerapa et halashon. 
See how beloved is the language of Torah. It is healing language. As indicated earlier, Moshe's late ability to engage in speech in Deuteronomy provides a trigger for this discussion. We won't have enough time to analyze the entire Midrash, but let me point out to you, however, two of the Midrash's terms in this discussion. Firstly, it states, line 1415, Le shel Torah metir et The word lehatil means to disentangle, as with a knot, lehatir kesher. It also indicates to set free, matir asuri, right? Or to release. Thus, the Midrash says, quote, the language of Torah disentangles language. The healing seems to be related to setting free. Further on, Rabbi Yochanan quotes the Greek word, line 17, terapion. This word alludes to medicine, trufa, while it also is constructed of the same basic letters as lehatil pe, to disentangle the mouth, to release the mouth that is to release speech. This idea is somewhat reminiscent of the Freudian idea that a certain type of therapy happened through the meander of speech. Question, what then is the knot, the prison, or the disease from which language needs to be disentangled, released, or healed? Let us now read a couple of lines from the Spatement. The first paragraph, again, establishes the principle that the world was created from the language of Torah, which preceded all existence. He then comments, in the second uh, paragraph from the Svatimet, V'chol ha-dvarim hem kumo levush l'inekudat ha-pnimiyut, v'halushonot shemitparesh b'hem divrei Torah, hem gam ken rak levush, ki ha-mamar ya Torah atzma, u-mitlabesh b'lishonot acherim. All words are like garments to the inner vital essence of things, or, let me say for Bergson, the melody. And the languages by which the words of Torah are interpreted are also but a garment. Because the original utterance of all is the Torah itself, which gets dressed in different languages, end quote. The Torah is the ma'amal, the ultimate origin of meaning, which transcends existence and yet infuses it. All languages are only garments of that ultimate sense. Such are the 70 languages, as well as the language of Torah itself. The Sfatamet draws on a medieval tradition and identifies the 70 languages with the concept of Shirim Panim, the 70 interpretations or faces of the Torah. You will see it in source number five. Our Sfatemet text here, text alludes to this through the word, line 28, So use the Loshanot from the languages, but it's about mitparesh. Thus, all translations and interpretations are no more than garments. Let us notice the Sfatemet devel develops this idea on the basis of the Midrash first topic. <laughs> about the translation of the Torah into foreign languages. At this point, he seemingly folds together the Midrash two topics, creating a dramatic link between translation interpretation and healing of language. Line 30. The key words are the and by thus, by interpretation and translation, language can be healed. Line 31. For this purpose, the sages permitted, note the play on the word hetil, the translation of the Torah into any language. Furthermore, it says, Ho'il Moshe Be'er et ha-Torah. Be'er. The Svatimet attends to the word Be'er to explain or to clarify, but also to Be'er, a natural well. 
a metaphor indicating in his writings the inner metaphysical strata of all beings, especially of the human being. Line 33. Uktiv be'er shekafi hitrachavut he'arat ha'torah b'malgushim ha'chitzoniim yoter shenitkarvim ha'kol ha'pnimiyut. Aydeze niftach ha'ma'ayan ha'pnimi b'yoter. The Svat Emet merges the two topics of the Midrash to suggest that the oral, the interpretative activity of the textual, is a practice that can generate new openings, new consciousness, new experiences of being, the ever-living and renewing fountain, Bergson's melody. Although these new meanings are not more than garments, and they also become text. They enable this spiritual experiential growth in the learner's relationships to both the outer and the inner music. Thus, for the Svatemet in another teaching that you don't have here, what Moshe models in his speaking, his interpretation of Torah in the Torah is his interpretation of Torah in the Torah. This is the beginning of Torah Shebaal Peh. It is the need to constantly open and reopen religious language with the understanding that this is the language in which the person has been occult, acculturated in his or her most inner strata of consciousness. In another teaching, the Svatemet adds, Moshe models what oral Torah entails for all human beings. Line number five, Asher Diber Moshe is an acronym for Adam. Likewise, the, more, the word Lemor, line number seven, indicates that like Moshe, thus shall they, the coming generations, say or engage in this kind of Torah shall Baal Hapeh activity. Similarly, as the Statement, the idiom Patach Ve'amar, such and such, as used in the Midrashic literature and in the Zohar, indicates an intentional attempt to open up, to release textual language. Earlier I asked, so what is the knot, the prison or the disease from which language needs to be disentangled, released or healed? For the Svatimet, it is the constantly lurking and natural tendency to lock oneself into semantic determinism the ever-imprisoning effects of language, and in particular of religious language, which closes the human being off from the ever-renewing flow of all existence. In the spirit of many more teachings of the Svatimet, I would say that the Torah Sheba al heals by acting on the dialectic of semantic determinism versus semantic innovation. From this perspective, Torah Sheba al is first and foremost a praxis of spiritual and ethical self-cultivation. This paper is part of a broader research project that lies at the intersection of educational research and the scholarship of the Hasidic homily. It explores uncharted grounds both in the Svatimet homilies as well as in their translation into pedagogical implications. I posit at this point that the Svatsemet's written homilies are a literally, interpretively, spiritually, and educationally distinct textual genre, which at least from a phenomenological perspective are designed through the literary and hermeneutical features to be conducive to such experience as well. I draw on the works of, of scholars like Moshe Idel, Arthur Green, and Shaul Magid to characterize the Hasidic exegesis as texts whose semantic aspects are subordinated to their experiential moments, emphasizing moral and devotional aspects and their inner transformation. Michael Fishbane shows that in rabbinic tradition, the thought process is fundamentally exegetical, and the reading and exegesis become existential categories, impacting individuals' spirituality and the learner's ethical and spiritual self-cultivation. 
It is at this interse intersection that the written and the oral meet to generate pedagogical interest. This connection obliterates the radical dichotomy of means and ends. It echoes major schools of thought in education according to which pedagogy, a term that captures the modes of engagement between teacher, learner, and subject matter, should be evaluated in its own right on the basis of its own educational impact. <coughs> this perspective redefines pedagogy from an instrumental <coughs> practice to an educative practice of self-cultivation. It aligns with philosopher Nicol Nicholas Davis' char characterization of the hermeneutic term, I quote, as encounters with texts are lived, learning from experience derives not just from that which is encountered, but from the character of the encounter itself. This hermeneutic term reflects a growing awareness of the impact of interpretive processes in literature and philosophy, emphasizing and inviting ref refined attention to the fabric, to the texture, and to the devices that are at play in the text as well as to ways people engage in meaning making with text, not only of text, with text, in and through written and oral language. The current cross-denominational quest for Jewish spirituality is reflected in growing interest in the study of Hasidic Rashot throughout both Israeli and American Jewish educational settings, especially for adults. Yet this nascent phenomena has not received the scholarly attention according to the study of other Jewish literary genres. There is a lack of discussion of what I am calling an ethics of reading, that is the spiritual, experiential, and pedagogical aspects that might be appropriate to the study of this distinctive hermeneutic, spiritual, and literary genre. To be sure, Contemporary learners do not necessarily share the metaphysical assumptions about language and Torah held by the Svatamet. However, phenomenological and hermeneutical and literary theories and the renewed focus on the existential role of language break new ground to explore how such a version of Torah shel ba'alapeh as a spiritual practice might translate into an ethics of reading. To conclude, two educational potential implications. For a practice-based philosophy of Jewish education, such an ethics of reading may challenge the discourse that prevails at times in circles of Jewish education, emphasizing the dichotomy between personal autonomy and textual authority. Against this dichotomy, this kind of renewed focus on the existential dimensions of written and spoken language opens new possibilities to think of the self during study not as an autonomous entity, but as radically interpersonal, continuously confronted with the presence of otherness and of the other. And at the crossroads between the textual and the oral, and beyond the individual realm, which I talked about in this paper, Perhaps such an ethics of reading will reflect something of what Jacques Derrida writes, quote, the Jew is split, and split first of all between the two dimensions of the letter, allegory and literality. His history would be but one empirical history among others if he established or nationalized himself with indifference and literality. He would have no history at all if he let himself be attenuated within the algebra of an abstract universalism. Thank you. Thank you for a really interesting talk.